Um, and also on behalf of um, the group that wrote the cultural identity uh, paper, um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to some of the themes uh, we discussed in the paper and how we approached the task as a group. The 10 students who worked together to produce this paper had a diverse range of community, political and cultural backgrounds, which ensured that we had many lively discussions throughout the summer. During our first WIP paper session, we hit on the idea of a vision of cultural identity which was inclusive and co incorporated a concept of civic values that everyone in Ireland and Northern Ireland could subscribe to. This idea drew on the formation of French cultural identity based on the civic values of liberty, equality and fraternity. The three pillars we chose to frame our vision of cultural identity in 2040 are, are freedom of cultural expression, equality of opportunity, and civic engagement. We explored the idea of how cultural expression can be informed by the concept of cultural accountability and how, informing, and how fostering a sense of civic duty can help to create a sense of belonging across the island. We wished to examine the elements which traditionally define Irish and Northern Irish culture while also taking into consideration the increasing diversity of culture which exists across the island in 2017. The recommendations in this paper are reflective of the discussions we had as a group of 10 this summer based on current cultural trends and our own background knowledge. They are by no means the only plausible responses to issues of cultural identity in Ireland and Northern Ireland. The paper represents a number of compromises we made as a diverse group to try and find consensus on issues that are simultaneously personal and universal. We hope that the vision we offer of a society in which inclusion, positive intercultural exchange and active civic participation are prioritised can, can make a positive and constructive contribution to future discussions of cultural identity. And we'll now begin the panel. Thank you. So, um, thank you, Rachel. I think whenever I was reading that paper, I was really um, challenged around this idea of freedom of cultural expression, but having accountability with that, and how do we balance that with people's kind of rights to, to express themselves, but also to respect the, the cultural identities of others. Um, this morning, but in exploring that in the context of Ireland and Brexit, um, I just wonder whether, was that something you guys discussed a lot in the summertime? Keen to hear your thoughts as well around that. Anything come up there? Um, so we did discuss um, Brexit as an mm. entire class a number mm -hmm. of times throughout the summer. Um, uh, we, in the con context of our cultural identity paper, um, we didn't decide to put it in there um, given that the the terms of the future uh, arrangement are so uncertain mm. um, and we can't tell what the uh, effect will be um, on cultural identity so we decided to focus on what we would aspire to create um, all things being well mm -hmm. in 2040 so mm. we sort of left Brexit off the table <laughs> in that regard. Okay and Mary maybe any reflections mm -hmm. from you on and what was just presented mm -hmm. and just that kind of dynamic of mm -hmm. expressing cultural identity but mm -hmm. having that accountability alongside that respecting mm -hmm. others. Well congratulations to Rachel and the team for mm -hmm. um, a really a really great piece of work and um, listening to some of the earlier speakers this morning uh, and the poetry in particular, I was, I was reminded of um, something Patrick Kavanaugh once said. Um, it was in The Green Fool, I think. And, and he, said, he said, to me, home was the only real flower, which makes one wonder why it is always the home lover who wanders. And that really chimed with me this morning because I've always felt in terms of my own travels, but I'm sure Rachel and all of you can appreciate that one of the best things about going away is what you can bring back. Um, and that chimed with me when I was reading your contribution because it has positivity and it has optimism and it has a can-do mindset. Um, and I think that's really important when we're tackling the kinds of very complex and challenging issues around cultural identity that you've, um, that you've talked about in this particular paper. And these are sometimes very uncomfortable discussions that we need to have as well. Um, so I can, appreciate, um, I can appreciate all of the points that you bring up in terms of freedom of expression and cultural accountability and that you could reach uh, something of a consensus in relation to how the island of Ireland perhaps as a whole might approach those. Um, and what I really liked was that 
you talked about traditional identity, traditional cultural identity on the island, but you were very forceful in making the point that actually identity is now so much more diverse than mm. it ever was previously. And that's something I think we all need to, we all need to acknowledge and we all need to talk about. Um, I can appreciate why you shied away from Brexit. Mm -hmm. um, there's probably too many people shying away from the Brexit discussion. Uh, I think it does have potentially an impact on identity. Um, the two parts of the island, Northern <coughs> Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, are now facing two different futures. Um, so the trajectory for both parts of the island um, has been uh, interrupted, so to speak. But I think there's an onus on all of us, and you make the point in your paper, um, to keep talking about it. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest messages from your paper, particularly in terms of civic engagement, young people talking about these issues. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I congratulate you again, but particularly for the optimism which you bring to the conversation and the, um, and, and the confidence that actually these are challenging issues, but they're ones that we all have the potential to deal with if we try hard. Mm -hmm. And Trevor, your response to hearing from Richard this morning and in the paper, I mean, particularly around this area of civic engagement as well and how we use that for um, people to be able to express their identity within that, that environment. Any kind of reflections on that? <clears throat> yes, first, again, mm -hmm. can I agree with Mary that, that, that I think a great paper and I congratulate you and your, your team on the work that they've done and, and producing this paper. And there's plenty of food for thought in it. Um, I think if I was to say anything in a constructive and critical way, it would be your, maybe your ambitions were a wee bit too restricted. Because I think that what you young people have is a chance to create a new future. And I would argue that as far as relationships go on this island, we couldn't actually have done them much worse than we did in the past. And we've taken some pretty hard decisions right across this island to actually free up the future for it to be shaped differently. Mm. So if hatred and violence was one of the determining influences on relationships on this island in the past, then let it be friendship and the building of relationships be the, the driving inspiration for the future and that driving influence. Because those that maintained relationships and built relationships and avoided violence in the past, they created the foundations upon which we hope to build a peaceful and stable future. I'm involved in a civic campaign and I think civic society has been leading that way mm. throughout the, the past century when we, we got, I would say, we got things so badly wrong. Um, and I think civic society and civic engagement is the way to shape the future differently. So even if we talk about Brexit, after Brexit there will st still be an Irish rugby team. Uh, we now have a whole group of unionists now getting Irish passports which has its own influence in that it makes those who are British more identifiably Irish, but it also makes Irish more British in the outworkings of that. And someone who played for the Irish rugby team uh, and the British and Irish rugby team many years ago, I always reflected during the worst of the times here just how all I ever experienced was friendship. And yet the other dynamic, my father was a police officer, guys who were on the team with me, were police officers and soldiers. They were 24 hour protection when they were down playing for Ireland, but all we ever experienced was friendship. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking for a model as to how to do things differently, that's the model to follow. Mm -hmm. And then we have this increasing diversity in our society, which is enriching us. And I use, and the Taoiseach used the actual co quotation from John Hewitt, the Ulster poet, in a debate that took place in the Irish Times in the 1970s. But I use a more modern version to say who we are, certainly as a Northern Irish, but I think in any society. And it was given to me uh, by a friend of mine when I said I was talking on, on identity issues that night. And his more adaptable version was, I'm a Belfast man, I'm an Ulsterman, I'm Irish and I'm British, and those are interchangeable, and I'm European. And anyone who takes away any one part of me uh, demeans me as a person. And what we can add to that is that diversity of of our new society, where people have come from all different parts of the world to make this their home. Mm. And so the challenge is, how do we create that sense of inclusion, whether it be Northern Ireland, in Ireland, uh, across the United Kingdom, to make this a place that they feel is a, their home, mm. and also that actually enjoys the diversity that they bring, 
because uh, it enriches us all. So I think your paper has, has brought out some really useful points. What I would say to you is, is be a wee bit more challenging to my generation because we got it so badly wrong and actually look at how to build a successful and inclusive society because that's the key both socially and economically for any future society. Hmm. And I was really interested to understand whether you guys explored the mindset of inclusion and diversity. And I think one of the things Trevor's talked about is um, your generation sort of wanting to fold in and help people feel a sense of belonging and that they can safely express their identity. Did you have any thoughts about how we might actually um, have that mindset of inclusion and diversity and help to you know maybe bring that into other generations i suppose as well uh, yes we talked um in some of the discussions we had as a group we talked about um having multi-layered identities within one person mm. so um being perhaps both um republican and lgbt or unionist and um identifying as a humanist um, and those and having those multiple identities be equally mm. important to you, or an e equal part of shaping um, your experience in, in uh, your local community. Um, and so we talked about how that will continue to influence identity going forward. Mm. Um, and that's something I think that's perhaps um, a change from previous generations, where perhaps one's nationalism or unionism was the sort of defining characteristic of your identity. Mm. And as we become a more diverse society with um, a greater number of uh, immigrants from uh, all across the world. Mm. I think we will see a greater um, diversity of multi-layered identities, and I think that was something that the chair was talking about there as well. Mm. Yeah, and in that kind of managing, I think of the the differences, I suppose, yeah. and. I, I'm just I'm really interested as well to hear Mary and Trevor from you around how we mediate that where we have you know someone as a Republican an LGBT or a unionist and you know associating with humanist humanism um, how do we bring those people together in a way that's constructive and I think um, constructive and um, disruptive in that we're allowing each other to express ourselves um, and those multi layers of our own identity Identity, but where they might clash or run up um, with someone else's identity, how do we kind of mm -hmm. seek to, to mediate mm -hmm. that kind of keen to? Well, I suppose you might expect me to say this, but um, education, mm -hmm. I think, and it's certainly mm -hmm. something that you drew out in the paper as well. I think it, it's about finding safe spaces, really, mm -hmm. isn't it? Where, where people can have those kinds of discussions. Um, but even in terms of nurturing the creation of those safe spaces, we need people to better understand each other. We need people to have contact with each other. We need people to communicate with each other. And I think one of the places where all of that can start is within the education system. Um, and it can certainly take place at third level. That's probably one of the, the more accessible places for those conversations to happen. But ideally, it should be happening much sooner in the education systems, whether it's here in the Republic or in, in Northern Ireland in terms of bringing young people together at the youngest possible ages from a diversity of backgrounds, religious, ethnic, um, LGBT, political, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's, a, there's a huge challenge here for future leaders in terms of shaping <coughs> educational systems which respond to the challenges of contemporary society but still taking account of some of those older arguments that we're still, still battling with. Um, so I, I guess it's, it's a point that you certainly bring out in the paper, um, but it's one that, from my perspective, um, is, is the key starting point um, for, for creating the kind of safe environment that you're alluding to. And Trevor, any reflections around maybe building on that, the safe spaces and that idea of mediating different um, identities and, and how that can kind of get played out in the future? I think there, there's so many ways of, of, of doing it and so many good examples of, of doing it. Um, we've started up the One Small Step campaign in Northern Ireland again, which is about promoting a shared future and it's challenging everybody. The three principles are if everyone could do something small to build a relationship, then all of that adds up to making a significant contribution to having a better society. It's about highlighting the good practice that's already going on because every problem we have has been solved by some group except dealing with the past. And 
the best way to deal with that past is to deal with an environment where we're healing as a society and healing as an island and building relationships. So at least we can turn around to the victims and say, that is never going to happen again. What happened to you and your family is never going to happen to future generations. And the third is about challenging leaders and saying, you have to stop pressing the divisive buttons. Identity is used to put people into simple boxes and always beware of simple boxes. We talk about, uh, we, we talk about Republican and LGBT or, uh, and those different groups and the way we divide people up but actually we're far more complex as individuals. Mm. Um, the Man United supporter also supports Real Madrid in sporting terms. Um, we move between different identities at different times. Rory McElroy, he's very proud to be from Northern Ireland, he's a proud Ulsterman, he's proud to be Irish, he's proud to be British, and when he plays in the Ryder Cup, he's also proud to be European. And we can <coughs> mix and match. Sometimes we compete, sometimes we work together. But education is the key because a lot of the things I've been involved in over the last 20 years has been simply about getting our children to meet at an early age. And in Northern Ireland, we prove that children can be educated together. Mm. There's one other sector in the education system that's fully integrated and people don't actually see it for what it actually is. And that's the sector that deals with kids with special needs, with disabilities. Mm. And that's because the parents there are focusing on what's in the best interest of the child. And it's social engineering the way we have our education system at the minute. It's not social engineering to bring kids together, it's social engineering to educate them apart. Mm. And I would be saying to the churches, you've got six months to come up with a formula that you're happy to apply to all the schools and bearing in mind the other faiths that are coming into our society. And if you can't come up with that, then you're out. You lose it. Mm. Uh, because it's a problem that lies at the very heart of our society. And the other thing is that we have to challenge is the, those leaders that promote the hatreds. And at the minute in Northern Ireland we have a particular problem in that politics is polarised. Mm. But the people actually aren't to the same extent as they were in the past. Mm -hmm. So the challenge in the future is can we, the people depolarise the politics or will the politics do what it did in the past and polarise the people? And that's the challenge to your generation to be far more challenging of the leaders in our society who press those old buttons. Violence was never justified on this island. It never was going to achieve anything. It was always counterproductive. The decade of commemorations we're currently in is a decade of failures, if you actually analyse it properly. Mm -hmm. And it's left a legacy which, as I said earlier, our generation have been trying to let go of, but for your generation to shape things differently. So please do not allow those ancestral voices to call out to you to try and shape your politics in the way politics was shaped in this island in the past. Mm -hmm. Edward Carson, he actually regretted the partition of the island, but he said something that was a very, uh, very sincere comment, but not recognised maybe in the way it should have been. He said, you'll never force unionists into United Ireland, but you might woo them. Now, if you're looking to build a relationship, whether it's with a future wife or husband or whatever, then the way to go about it is to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think it was good advice then, and it's certainly good advice as we look to the future. Thank you. I'm keen to um, hear any comments and questions from those maybe involved in class of 2017 um, around this issue. Or, uh, yeah, is there anyone? Hand up, and then if you can just introduce yourself and if you want to direct a question at someone um, who's going to kick us off. <laughs> Oh, yeah, great. Go for it. My name is my name. <coughs> I want to take up the point about the idea of, um, of safe spaces and the idea of discussion. And one thing I think that you definitely see in, in American universities, and maybe increasingly in Ireland as well, but there's a bit of a, a kickback to it, surprisingly enough. I thought, like, I've just finished in Trinity, and then. Um, in Trinity this year, there's a, a new kind of conservative, um, what, what the conservative element would kind of characterise as this kickback against maybe a decade or plus of a very social liberal domination in, in college. So the type of, um, the, the inability, if you like, of, of people with a conservative uh, point of view to be able to, to speak um, in what they regard as, as something that's just been created as a safe space to keep their voices out, what, what would you say in, in terms of uh, that type of thing, do you think, uh, can you genuinely have a proper debate if something is just 
uh, constructed to keep people's feelings um, maintained at the highest level at all time, or is there is there some kind of balance that you can strike? I think if I could answer that, I think there's this genuine concern that's been emerging over the last number of years of the liberalism of the liberals and the shutting down of actual liberal debate. And I think it's really important. You have a right in our society to offend and and be and so an expectation that you also have to be you, you can be offended. But we allow those discussions to take place because in having those discussions we actually shape the future and, and challenge it existing attitudes. Like if you even look at the development in our society on around gay issues over the last 10 or 15, 20 years and look where it was 20 years ago to where it is now and those are but hard debates being had and people tolerating those debates and challenging each other and hopefully then you get the best result uh, having had those challenges but I do see around the world a problem with the liberalism of liberals. They have to allow those debates to take place mm. Um, but they are there to challenge them and they should robustly challenge them where they disagree and that's mm -hmm. the way our society functions. Mm -hmm. Great, go for it, yes. Uh, my name is Mark McKiernan, I was on the uh, Cultural Identity oh, Panel okay. too, so just be interested to hear your thoughts. When we, like, we had lots of heated discussions, um, as Rachel alluded to, there was a range of views north and south, um, you know, we're Republican and uh, Unionists right across the spectrum, left and right, so it was very, very difficult for us to come up with an Irish uh, identity by, by 2040. Do you see, um, you know, kind of legislate, le legislation is the way forward? Do you think that the state has a more constructive role to play? Um, you know, because we were talking a lot, you know, about kind of looking at what is the culture at the minute, and then we were trying to forecast maybe like real demographic shifts in 2040. So maybe mm -hmm. should it, we just let it exist organically and let civic society come forward? We didn't mention about the idea of rights and the idea of being included in. in European Charter and, you know, kind of following a more statutory framework. I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts mm -hmm. and opinions and, yeah. and how you feel like that should develop. Mm. Um, I, th I think it's, it's very difficult. Um, identity questions are very difficult because identity is ultimately about what you feel. It's, it's not something you can necessarily legislate for or, or around very, very easily. Um, and identity does change and evolve, we know that, um, and it has done so, done so over time, and, and it's likely to continue to do so, maybe even particularly in the context of Brexit, as all of this works itself out. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't necessarily be in favour of, um, of strident measures which seek to engineer um, any sort of identification as such. Um, it's, it, it, it is more organic than that, and it should be more organic than that. Um, identity, should, identity draws off your, your, your life experience, um, it draws off your aspirations, it draws off your, you know, your, your enjoyment um, of, of the world around you. Um, so um, I think you need, to be, you need to be very careful in terms of um, how, you, how you deal with that at, at a political or at a, at a legal level. Yep. Hello, uh, my name is Patrick Flanagan. I did uh, work in 2007. And congratulations, first of all, on the paper. Um, we challenged ourselves to think about these issues uh, when I did work when this paper was much more nuanced and much more focused than the paint that we produced. Um, I guess I'd just like to ask this, the people who prepared the paper and also the panel um, in getting to these objectives that you have here and in the paper, whether if Leo was still sitting here, what would be the three uh, policy recommendations you, you'd recommend mm. uh, to, to, to an Irish government or, or to a, an Northern Irish executive uh, to create the space effectively, not, not to engineer any type of identity, mm. but to create the space to allow for freedom of cultural expression, to allow for equality of opportunity, to allow for civic engagement. Thank you. Mm. That's a good question, and a tough one. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't like to pick three on my own, so if anybody from the group wants to nominate one. There's consensus. Um, uh, I think probably in terms of, uh, in the frame of the question you've asked, I think civic engagement is probably the key thing that perhaps we would um, uh, find common ground with, with uh, Leo Varadkar on. Um, because in terms of the, this frame of reference we can speak to as young people, we know that us being civically engaged is, is how we got involved essentially in WIP and the things that we're currently doing. 
um, and that touched on finding also equality of opportunity within education and within um, uh, employment as well. Um, and I don't think we could achieve essentially what uh, I don't think we could achieve any really of the vision in um, in the paper without uh, putting civic engagement um, at the heart of it, but also with an understanding of equality of opportunity. So essentially, there isn't a particular proposal that um, that I would say three particular proposals that I would say um, would be the priority, but I would say the, all of the pillars are key. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I find it hard to pick a favourite, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Trevor. I put three things out there. I think mm. it's getting the balance of rights and responsibilities, mm. because it actually works. Too much focus on rights and not enough focus on responsibilities creates an actual imbalance in the way um, the way things are perceived. You, know, you might have a right to do something, but you have a responsibility to do it in such a way that maybe it doesn't cause offence or it doesn't impact on somebody else's rights and responsibilities. The sense of inclusion, at the driving it has to be, um, an Irishness that's promoted to include me has to be one that includes me, and I'm also British, so you have to define that in a sense of inclusion in a way that's inclusive. It's not okay anymore, and it's in the 1998 agreement, you can be either Irish or British, but I think the, the agreement didn't go far enough. It's not okay anymore to create that sense of Irishness. If, if somebody's aspiring to have a United Ireland that doesn't include me, who's also British, because my Britishness also includes the Irish, uh, and in the wider sense as well. And we're so much, so many links between <coughs> our societies. So that creative sense of inclusion and violence will never solve the problems in this island. We've tried it, and it's just compounded the problems. And the key thing is to stop it now. Not let anybody say you owe anybody, whether they be a hunger striker or somebody who murdered somebody or shot somebody. You do not owe them anything in regards to the future. Okay, stop it now and create something that's different. And the third, in relation to civic society, it's a partnership. Politics doesn't work on its own. They, I have a mandate. Yes, you have a mandate. My son, when he was 11, he stood in school for election. And being my son, he ran under the, the policy of free sweets for everybody. <laughs> Did he get elected? Yes, he got elected. Did anybody get free sweets? No. <laughs> that was my fault. I should have said, insisted that he bought the most free sweets. Politics presses buttons in a strange way in the pursuit of power. So we need to be more demanding of them that they pursue power to be used for the benefit of the society that they're elected to serve. And also they have, should regard civic society as having an equal say in things and helping to shape the society that we all live in. Yeah, I mean, I would share all of that. Um, and and on, on Rachel's point, um, I mean, again, I go back to the same two themes in a way, education and civic engagement. And I think from, from a young person's perspective, civic engagement, maybe particularly for your generation, is, is key. And Ireland is actually quite good at civic engagement when it puts it, its mind to it. You know, we've had experiments like the Constitutional Convention, we've had citizens' assemblies. At the moment, we've got the all Ireland Civic Forum on, on Brexit, which unfortunately not everyone is taking part in. But nevertheless, it, it is a forum, uh, um, and it's been an effective forum. In the past, we've had the Future of Europe discussion, traveling forum around the country. Um, and all of these are very important ways of informing people and of educating people, of giving them the you know, non-fake news to allow them to make decisions um, and to allow them to engage with certain subjects. Um, so I think all of these, these things are key and, and I do get a sense that um, civic engagement, um, it's, it's not always what it should be, even though there are opportunities, um, people don't necessarily always engage, there are many distractions in life, I appreciate that. Um, I, I was asked recently to speak at an event in Balnasloe, and I live in Cork. So I got in the car and I drove to Balnasloe to speak at an event looking at the European Investment Plan in um, Balnasloe Library and I never turned off the wipers during the four hours of the journey to Balnasloe. <laughs> and I got there and it was myself and two or three other speakers and um, no one showed up for the event. So I went to Balnasloe for uh, a cup of tea and a sandwich and then I got back in the car and uh, I guess the final indignity was that they had just beaten Waterford in the All-Ireland hurling <laughs> final. <laughs> and I'm from Waterford, so I felt particularly aggrieved. Um, and you know, I can appreciate that you know, you know, these sorts of opportunities are available and um, it's a source of great regret when, when, when there isn't the kind of engagement that's possible. Um, so again, for you as young leaders, actually, 
engineering that kind of engagement is, is something that you should, uh, or, or pioneering that kind of engagement actually even more so, is something that's very important because these kinds of conversations produce outputs and they produce outputs which are about inclusivity and which are about partnership and which ultimately produce outputs around which all of us can marshal um, and around which, you know, the, these, these can be supported because of the ways in which they have been produced. Um, so so I, I really do believe in, in, in the value and the merit of civic engagement and I was, I was really delighted to see it in your paper. Thank you. Thank you. And um, that concludes our first um, panel discussion. Again, I just want to congratulate you, Rachel, and the guys involved um, with writing this paper. I think lots of things I'm mulling over already. And do I really encourage you guys to continue these discussions. Um, this is really the whole purpose of the WIT papers is it's a dialogue, it's by design going to be compromised and finding consensus and that that's an ongoing process as we grapple with the issues that we face. Um, so well done and thank you to Mary and to Trevor for um, contributing today and helping us um, navigate the, the cultural identity for 2040 in Ireland. And um, So please put your hands together for the panel. <laughs>